Grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that we considered here this morning came from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 8. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. So far our text. In the name of our Lord, who preserves all people, Elijah and us, dear fellow redeemed. Is it alright to pray for that? This question comes up sometimes when discussing what prayer is, what it's to be used for, what it should be used for. Jesus instructed his followers to pray because all that they asked in his name, the Father would give to them. He hears and he answers prayers. And he instructed them to pray also by his words that are recorded in Matthew. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. He would deliver them from their troubles and glorify them, as the psalmist said in Psalm 50. But is it alright to pray for that? Well, what's that? That can be a lot of things. It can be asking God for a material want or need, something to help us in our day-to-day -day lives. It could be something used in the long term to aid us in what we're doing. It could even be something in the short term to make it a little bit easier. That could also be asking God to end suffering, perhaps something even self-inflicted, if you will. You may have noticed in our text this morning that the prophet Elijah certainly had a unique prayer that he lifted up to God in the midst of his troubles. And admittedly, it was a self-inflicted problem because he had run away. He prayed, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Is it alright to pray for that? Well, we need to take a step back here and consider what was going on at the time. In our text, 1 Kings 19, verses 1 and 2 tell us that Ahab and Jezebel, or Ahab told Jezebel, rather, all that Elijah had done and all that he had done, that is, King Ahab. And we learned a few chapters earlier in 1 Kings 16 that Ahab wasn't exactly a good guy. In fact, Ahab was a terrible ruler. He had done evil in the sight of the Lord. He worshipped Baal. He had set up an altar to him, and he had even carved a false image of wood of him. Chapter 16, verse 33 tells us that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. And then you have Jezebel, his wife, who was a vicious and evil woman. We're told that she had massacred many prophets of the Lord. The prophet Obadiah led and sheltered a hundred of them away from this 
power hungry couple that were mad with rage and everything else that made them the way that they were. So when 1 Kings 18 rolls around, Obadiah was surprised to see Elijah and was just as surprised when Elijah told him to go present Ahab with a message. You see, the land had been in a drought and experienced famine for some time, and the Lord would send rain when the message was delivered. And it was a simple enough message. It was that the prophet Elijah was there. So Obadiah delivered this message, and Elijah and King Ahab met on top of Mount Carmel, or Carmel rather, and the Lord demonstrated that he was the one true God by burning that sacrifice that the prophets of Baal had repeatedly drenched in water. They couldn't get it to light themselves. The nation of Israel was there too, and they were on the fence about all of these things. Even though they knew that the Lord God was the one true God, they were still swayed by Baal. But after seeing this, seeing that sacrificed engulfed with the flame, they were somewhat convinced at the time. And Elijah ordered them to take those 450 prophets down to the river and put them to the sword. And after this had happened, Ahab had made his way back to Jezebel. And so that begins our text here this morning where Ahab recounted everything that he had seen. Jezebel was not taken by that account of the one true Lord engulfing that sacrifice even though it was soaking wet and a testament of his true power. Rather, she was full of rage and upset and she sent a messenger to tell the prophet Elijah a threat that she would kill him just as those prophets of Baal were put to the sword and this spooked the prophet in a moment of weakness and he went away into the wilderness to hide after he had left his servant in Judah it is enough Elijah prayed to the Lord but that brings up a new question. What constitutes as enough? The prophet had previously faced off against a king, 450 prophets, and a whole bunch of people there to watch it who were sitting on the fence. They, too, could have potentially gone against Elijah. So we're talking well over 400 people here, and it didn't seem to phase the prophet at all. Why was there no hesitation there? Well, we don't have an answer to that. Why did this situation with the messenger giving him Jezebel's message rile him up so much? And again, we don't know what was going through his mind. In this situation, it wasn't even Jezebel that came to meet him face to face. She had sent a servant to tell Elijah that he would be put to death. And so, what did he pray for instead of death? Verse 4 of 1 Kings 19 tells us that he prayed for death. He prayed that he might die. Is it alright to pray for that? Elijah was in a desperate, desolate position at this point. And on the one hand, we can commend him because he prayed to God, the one true God, for this release. He didn't take it upon himself at any point. He didn't go to any false gods. He didn't commit suicide or ask somebody else to hold the sword for him to fall on. But we would also be stepping over a line to say for sure that he was completely right in this situation. It was bleak. It was a matter of life and death. But what constitutes as enough? Something that was asked here during the service this morning is how many of you watching this have endured truly agonizing trials and hardships in your life? I would say most, if not all of you. 
who hasn't been affected by the death of a loved one, who hasn't been in a situation where it seems like the only option we have is to sit idly by while we watch the world crumble around us or we see someone close to us suffering and we feel as if there's absolutely nothing we can do about it in that situation. Which one of you hasn't been hurt? Or who hasn't been sick? You know, perhaps these things haven't affected you personally, and thank God for that if that is the case. But this is a fallen world of sin, and trouble lurks around nearly every corner. And you have to remember that these are things that hurt the body, but Satan still uses them to lead people astray by asking and having you ask, why would a loving God allow such suffering? Was that what Elijah asked? We don't know. Elijah was at a dire point in his life. He let the worldly events shape his thoughts. In fact, it wasn't worldly events. It was the one event that shaped his thoughts as he made his way into the wilderness, as he sat under that broom tree to ask the Lord to just go ahead and let me die. He knew that he messed up by running away. We hear that in his own words, that he was no better than his fathers who had constantly rebelled against God, so much so that they were forced to go into the wilderness for 40 years. He wanted an end to this current suffering, and he prayed, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. And the fascinating thing about this is that the Lord heard the prayer of Elijah, and he answered it. But he didn't strike down the prophet in his moment of weakness. Elijah suffered something that each one of us suffers in our Christian lives at one point or another. Something we're told about in the book of Romans, chapter 8. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. If we consider that question that we asked at the very beginning, is it alright to pray for that? The answers might vary. It might depend on the context. It might depend on uh, the certain situation in front of you. But did Elijah pray that prayer that he did anyway? Yeah, he did. And do we make that same prayer at times, perhaps with different wording, asking God to take pity on us and to just immediately end whatever suffering it is that we're going through at whatever moment in our lives? Absolutely. Because the sinful human flesh makes many, many, many mistakes. But thankfully, our heavenly translator makes none. Instead of it being a prayer for a swift death, the Holy Spirit instead petitions that this life is indeed enough. You know what? Yeah, it is. There's too much going on for us to handle. It's too much for us. By ourselves, we're hopeless. We are spiritually dead and fast approaching a permanent death, not just of body, but of soul as well. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. Elijah was asking that the Lord take his life in the sense of a swift death. But the petition here was heard with those groanings of the Spirit and intercession. Not that the Lord should strike Elijah down and kill him, but rather take his life and use it for the Lord's purposes. Elijah's prayer was answered with a resounding no from God because God would use it to answer it in a far better way and use it for something far greater. And that's exactly what happened out there in the wilderness. It was a seemingly small event that happened here. It was merely that the Lord allowed him to rest and to eat. 
The Lord knew all that had happened to his prophet. He was present throughout it. He saw Elijah run in fear from the death threat of an extremely dangerous person who could have easily carried it out. And he saw that weakness of Elijah as he sat under that broom tree in shame and asked for a release from this life. But as a loving father, God did not scold him or belittle him for this. He knew why Elijah had done this, even if it was for the wrong reasons. Instead, God showed his mercy. He let him sleep a little bit after that long journey. He sent an angel to touch him in reassurance. He provided him with food and drink. And this happened twice. And the second time that the angel told him, he said, Arise and eat, because the journey ahead is too great for you. The journey was too great for Elijah, just as the journey before us is too much for us. But the Lord hears all of our prayers, even those mangled ones that come out like this prayer that Elijah did, those mangled prayers that we utter when we have no idea how to word it, when we're in our absolute most desperate states. The journey ahead is enough. It's too great. But in God's mighty hands, the journey is doable. And the prayers are heard. The temptation might arise in us to run away when things get tough or to quiet those many fears that we have with self-prescribed means. But don't be led astray by these things. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And yes, God delivered Elijah from Jezebel and every other trouble that he had in his life. And there's almost a bit of irony in this account, too, when you consider how this greatest prophet met his end, how he eventually died, because Elijah didn't die at all. Like Enoch, he was taken into heaven. These are the only two people in all of history who have never died. It was a unique situation, and yet in both scenarios, God was demonstrating his power and his mercy. His whole life, God would provide for Elijah. And that same benevolent God watches over each of you. He hears your prayers. Sometimes he's going to answer you with a no. And thank God that he does. Because he answers prayers in due time and with far greater results than you or I could ever hope for. In each moment of our lives, His grace is sufficient for you, and His strength is made perfect in weakness. And so may it be our prayer as well that the Lord would take our lives. No, not like Elijah had previously prayed, but with the confidence that the Lord will use each one of us for His purposes, knowing that He works all things for good to those that love Him. We have confidence in his word because it feeds our hungry souls with the bread of life. Because the weight of this life, its troubles, and the crushing burden of sin have made it too much for us. But it was not too much for God, Jesus Christ, who endured all things for all people. The cry of us sinners in desperation will always be, It is enough. But the triumphant cry of Jesus Christ as he hanged from the cross was, It is finished. And it was. And it is. He has overcome the world. The blood of Jesus, the resurrection, the ascension, and his inevitable return all remind us of this. That God is in control. We don't have to shoulder the burden of this world. We don't have to run away in fear. 
we can go directly to God in prayer and we know that he will answer it in the best possible way. As sinners made pure by his sacrifice, may we pray the words as Elijah did, not with the intention of dying, but with the full intention of living. Because his grace is sufficient for us and will be with us until our dying day where eternal life waits for us. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life and use it as you see fit. Amen.